everybody. This is Randall Thomas, and the name of the talk is Yeah, But Should We? Thank you. Thank you so much. Keep it up. No, uh, so it's, um, I know it's pretty early, so for all of you who are out, like, possibly drinking and have a little bit of that whiskey voice going on, thanks for showing up. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so we got a lot to cover here. Uh, it's pretty early, so... I don't really need an intro anymore. Uh, but I do actually have a couple questions. Actually, how many people here, this is like your first Elixir Conf? Oh, holy crap. Um, and you might actually throughout this presentation hear me say things like Smurf or some other things. How many people have actually seen one of my talks before? How many people have actually heard the beeping and happens from some of those talks? Like there's this great mystery that actually about where did my Elixir talk go, like from Elixir Conf, and I found out later that apparently there were so many sensors that they had to put in it, it took them a month to actually edit the stuff out. And I was about to say something other than stuff. Smurf, 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 smurf. Anyway, so uh, there are lots of reasons you might come to a conference, right? Um, you could come to learn the great new thing, you could come to learn like why not to do something. Um, you could come to be inspired. This is animation, people. Come on. So um, how many people come to conferences to like be inspired and like get jazzed about stuff? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, I hate to tell you, this is not that talk. Because if I do this correctly, you are about to experience one of the most uncomfortable tech talks you have ever seen in your entire life. And in fact, this is what's going to happen. Welcome to Uncomfortable Population You. So don't think of this as a journey through things that should basically tell you like, ooh, yeah, I'm gonna get the all excited to write software. Think of it as this is what about to happen. <laughs> and as we all know, nothing good happens after the portal gun, nothing. So don't say that I didn't warn you. If you have some sensations throughout this talk that make you feel like this, the exits are clearly marked. There are no store assist, so you're gonna have to stagger and run for them on your own. So the question here is, what are we gonna cover? We're gonna talk about disasters, man-made, uh, natural, artificial. We're gonna talk about some of the, my favorite isms, sexism, racism, and pessimism. We're gonna talk about this. I know it's early, but do the math and you'll laugh. Face, really, nobody does rebuses anymore? Anyway, okay, fine. Facebook, right? Wow, that's a new one, that's a new low for me. It's my first visual dad joke, awesome. <laughs> anyway, so um, basically fine, fine. We'll just skip this slide. I'm gonna tell you where we're gonna end up because this is the kicker. Does everybody know how to end an argument on the internet? Boom. We are actually going to end this talk with an argument that would basically break the internet, right? So the question is, out of all those things we just talked about, what do they all have in common? And you might not believe it, but what they all actually have in common is software, right? The stuff that we build every day, the way that we make our living, what brings and ties these things together is software. So um, I like to call this act one. Yeah, you guys can see where this is going, right? And I'm telling you, this is about as comfortable as things are going to get all morning. So I hope you've got a burrito and some coffee because we are in this for the duration. So anybody know what this is? I mean, you can read the title at the bottom, but really, uh, how about this? Did anybody fly on one during that very uncomfortable period? Because <laughs> if you did, you'd remember, right? So this is the max. Does anybody know what this is? That's exactly right. This is Lion Air Flight 610, uh, scheduled domestic flight, because I can't actually pronounce this, from Socorro Hatta to Jakarta, Departi Amir. On a 29 October 2018, Boeing 737 MAX crashed off the Java Sea 13 minutes after takeoff. 189 people aboard the flight, passenger and crew, were lost. Right? Told you I wasn't going to be happy. Anybody know what this is? March 10th, 2019, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302-737 MAX crashed approximately six minutes after takeoff from Addis Ababa Airport in Ethiopia. 149 passengers, eight crew aboard. The aircraft was four months old. And as we now know that it wasn't clearly patched. 
not so funny, is it? This is the maneuvering characteristics augmentation system because you know, we write software, we're engineers, we love to have acronyms for things, right? It hides the complexity of things. Does anybody actually know what the purpose of the MCAS was? That's right. It was supposed to make the plane easier to fly and safer at high angles of attack and low speeds. So the safety feature that was added to this plane as a way to reduce overall training costs was essentially, uh, as a summary here, let me see if I can get this. MCAS was the primary cause of the Lion Air Flight 601 crash. And then they go on to say some stuff about a flight control sensor and blah, 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 pilot training contributing to things. Kind of like one of those statements where it's like, the point was the first sentence. Everything that came after that was not necessary. So the FAA, in its wisdom after two crashes in six months, said, hey, <laughs> we should probably figure out what's going on here. It makes you really happy that they're really on top of things, right? So they did an analysis, and in their analysis, they didn't really result like release the results, it wasn't open source, but you know, hey. They predicted 15 crashes over its expected lifespan of 45 years, killing more than two, two, yeah, two, oh, that is 2,000. Yeah, 2,000 people. Anybody know who this is? It's down there in the left-hand corner, you can cheat, it's cool. This is an interactive session, people. I know there are gonna be some quiet moments, but feel free to raise your hands, jump in, this is the, actually now, as it says, former CEO of Boeing, he basically describes this. So um, they describe the entire process that they went through. There was a lot, you can tell, that there was a lot of stuff. You might remember people had to show up in front of Congress for this. This was in the news for a long time, right? So I wanted to highlight a key word here. Do you see what's over there on the left with the big red arrow? Can somebody read that? Software. Right, what do we write? Software. Exactly, right? So it was the software that was the problem in this instance. And <laughs> I think that you could say for this slide, this is left as an exercise for the reader, right? Do we really need to say anything else? I mean, I don't know, do we? Yes, no? Raise show of hands. Does that kind of like close the book on this? Software was responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people and projected possibly if somebody hadn't caught this bug, maybe 2,000 more. And remember, this is just a, it's only a model, right? It's like Camelot, it's only a model, right? Maybe it would have been 4,000, who knows? But we are gonna say something more because um, do you realize that Washington State gave Boeing um, 8.7 Billion. Sometimes I gotta look at these numbers because I have to make sure that they're right because some of them are mind-boggling. In 2013, they gave Boeing 8.7 billion in tax breaks, according to Business Insider. Um, now, does anybody know what this is? Careful, it could be a trick question. I am known for those, anyone? That's actually true, that's, that's the uh, Orion, right? I think it is. Um, but this is actually the best I could figure out for a parachute. It's not golden, but it should be. Because uh, the payouts to families were about 100 million. That's about $150,000 per family. The CEO, upon his termination, apparently garnered $62 million. Right, uh, that's the Orion multi-purpose probe. Um, it's made by Lockheed Martin. You can tell because it didn't crash. <laughs> oh, you think I'm joking. <laughs> No, I'm not, because as The Register, one of my favorite websites of all time, I'm a big fan. Does anybody read The Reg? Oh, come on, guys. Like, this is the best sarcastic IT news you're ever gonna get. They, they basically literally will take out anybody. So, um, yeah, that would be another software error where the clock was essentially off by 11 hours when they put it on top of the rocket, so it thought it was a half day forward, and it basically just fired its rockets at the wrong time. So um, now, once again, you have to forgive me because some of these notes I actually need to look at because they include things from these fancy reports and I can't remember them, but there's this, this phrase down here they used. There were other three other bugs, including one that could induce, quote, loss of vehicle, unquote. <laughs> so 
what happened last night? Well, I was drinking a little whiskey. I was down at the bar. So where, where's the car? Well, as it turns out, um, Basil Hayden's pretty powerful stuff, and uh, I uh, had a loss of vehicle failure. Um, so, officer, if you could just uh, call me an Uber, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Loss of vehicle. That basically means the people in the vehicle, too, just to be clear. And um, once again, I'm not a huge fan of big tech slides, but we can kind of go through this one, right? Mostly, it's not about whether or not they could have uncovered the defects. It's about when NASA tells you that you should have caught the bugs, eh, maybe you want to listen. Maybe they have a statement there, right? And just to make sure we're clear, um, this is not a MAX. This is actually the 737NG. And the upshot of this one is apparently in the 737NG, they recently discovered a bug where at some airports, at some westward landings, all the screens in the cockpit go blank. <laughs> now, <laughs> not a bug, thank you. It's a feature, not a bug. What was I thinking? <laughs> now, I'm just curious who the first person to open a ticket for this one was. I'm thinking it's not the software people, and I'm thinking it's some guys. I, I, I promise Bruce I would try not to curse so much, but I would love to try and imitate what was probably being said in the cockpit, but I can't because I told Bruce I wasn't going to be cursing every three seconds of this. So, you know, so now I know what everybody here is thinking. <laughs> but that is not the way to be productive here. This is friggin' nuts, <laughs> right? These are airplanes. These are software that's going into an airplane. We actually have people putting software in an airplane. And they're like, eh, it's all right. You know, the thing to remember is that that software was written by developers. We are developers. They were us, right? So act two, the rebus that I had to explain, which somewhat makes it less witty and a little less funny, and you guys have basically accused me of telling you a visual jad joke. Um, does anybody know who this is? Don't worry. If you don't recognize her, it's okay, because computers don't recognize her either. Did you catch that? So um, this is basically Joy Boy Mwini. She is the founder of the, uh, the Algorithmic Code Justice League. And just to be sure that you see exactly what's going on, um, when she has a perfectly blank white mask on, it detects a face. And when she doesn't, it doesn't see her. She's actually a researcher at the MIT Media Lab, and she's smarter than all of us put together. She was also uh, a scholar at Oxford and basically has a whole bunch of things behind her name that says, I'm smarter than you and I can write about it too. So she does research in this area and her thesis was actually at the MIT Media Lab was the one that uncovered much of the bias that happens in facial recognition algorithms uh, with Amazon recognition, Google AI. So does anybody remember when this little thing happened? It was a small kerfluffle, right? Uh, you done smurfed up now, Google. <laughs> so they kind of got this wrong, right? Because just to give a recap here, because I'm a big fan of recaps, they kind of said this plus this equals that. Now, as of 2018, to the best of my knowledge, this is still not fixed. So how many people here know anything a little bit about machine learning and tagging? I, I mean, everybody should. If you've been to any of my talks, I've been telling you for 10 years, guys, to learn statistics, right? So here's what they did. They didn't actually fix it. They just removed the word gorilla from the classification algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, so let's get this straight. So you think I'm a smurfing smurf hole? Yeah, yeah. Well, I am not a smurf hole. No, I'm just not going to call you a smurf hole, but you're still a smurf hole. That's fine. That's basically what they said. It's not that the AI doesn't think that they're gorillas. It's now that they train the AI not to tell you that it thinks you're a gorilla. Well, isn't that a vast improvement? <laughs> so, this is actually where the, the information, that link at the bottom is where they actually talk about this and how they essentially have gone through and shown that the AI algorithm cheats. So 
facial recognition systems are actually 10 to 100 times more likely to make an error with Native Americans, people of color, and women. Was it the current number is about roughly 51.4% of our population. It doesn't work for them. Think about this. How about this? Uh, just so you know, next time you go to the head, the bathroom, only one out of two toilets will work, but it's up to you to guess which one. Have fun with that. So, okay, why should we care? Why does this matter? Anybody ever hear of this company? So Clearview claims to have sold its AI and facial recognition system to over 600 law enforcement agencies around the world, uh, including some of the United States, it's all over. They won't disclose exactly how many people are using it, but also apparently this article indicates that they have discovered that universities have started to use this system as well. So university police departments. Um, they did it by essentially violating the terms of service of almost every social network in existence and scraping three billion plus pictures off of the web. Facebook, of course, found out long afterwards, but I suspect they might have been concerned about some guys out of Cambridge doing some Analytica stuff. Maybe they just weren't, hadn't had their eye on the ball. Whatever, right? It's not that bad. Oh wait, it is that bad. So they're starting to sell their facial recognition tech, which apparently doesn't work and has failed multiple times, uh, almost every ability to try and prove whether or not it's accurate. They're trying to sell it to regimes around the world, to authoritarian regimes. Now, I mean, right, it can't get any worse than this, right? Of course it can, so you, now you understand. We're through the green portal, you've seen my talks, and I can't curse, so I have to punish all of you. This is Willie Lynch. Willie Lynch was actually busted by some cops in Jacksonville, Florida for doing a $50 crack cocaine deal. Now let me describe to you the evidence they had. They, apparently this gentleman, they say this gentleman walked up to their car, offered to sell them some cocaine. So they surreptitiously took their feature phone, put it up to their ear and took some snaps. Now a feature phone for those of you who are actually probably too young to remember are the ones that folded in half and didn't break with the glass. They're notorious for having crappy cameras and really bad service, but they had really cool names like StarTac, right? So they took some snaps, this is actually apparently one of the pictures, and they used it to otherwise uh, run it through a facial recognition system and identify this individual. They then arrested him and then sentenced him to between eight, he was sentenced to eight years, but he was actually up for 30. When the ACLU took the case saying that the system returned a low probability of match, so his conviction should probably be at least revisited, the appeals court said, no, nah, no, nah, we're good. So just so you know in America, we actually have a pretty great false conviction rate. It's only about five to 8% in cases where we have DNA. He was staring at 30 years, he got eight, and the court said he has no right to actually interrogate the system that provided the information that sent him to jail. Now, I'm not sure if you remember, but allegedly we have the right to face our accusers. Well, apparently that right does not extend to software that's under copyright. So, I just wanted to point out um, you guys probably know there's probably going to be another change of Supreme Court coming up sometime soon. It's kind of a big deal. Are we all following this? The justices on the Supreme Court likely change. RBG is probably not going to be so notorious in a little bit. So I want to introduce you to your new justice. But it's Clippy, right? So Clippy says everything at least twice. I mean, as humorous as this is, Clippy was probably a better implementation because at least it was fit for the purpose. Annoying the, the, the smurfing, uh, yeah, the smurf out of you. Um, that is really hard not to swear. Holy crap. <laughs> so I've got no words, right? Like I am literally, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm throwing my hands up here because if you think about this, how about this? Would any of you let me write a PHP script that would sentence you to prison? VB script maybe? I think we were having a joke, we were actually having some jokes at Excel's, at Microsoft Excel's expense yesterday with some, some people we were talking about this. In fact, actually, random aside, uh, 
we were we used to do a lot of work in Excel and um, not by choice. And I remember one day in a moment of peak and frustration, uh, one of the other devs said, you know the worst virus we could possibly write? I'm like, what? He's like, something that would just hang out and change every value in an Excel spreadsheet just a little bit. <laughs> just randomly. Like 0 0.1, 0 0.01, a small delta. And uh, I'm not saying that if that ever comes out, that maybe it's out there right now. <laughs> maybe it's out there adjusting your home loan and you don't know. Right, so, but this guy got eight years from a piece of software, like a real effect on his life, on a system that basically returned a low quality match that we already know is less accurate on people of color anyway for a group of people who generally speaking are more victimized. That being he's a double, he's a double loser, right? He's a drug addict and he's black. And he, well, triple loser and he's actually he's Florida man. Holy crap. <laughs> so, so now I know what you're thinking, right? You're thinking, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is this is the problem with the Internet of of things, or the Internet of Smurf that we keep talking about, right? Um, this is an issue that we're going to run into only because this is the modern era, right? Well, it wouldn't be a Randall talk if we didn't actually go as deep into the depressing hole as we could, would it? So this is Act Three. Um, and so there are actually some pretty disturbing things in this part, so I, I, I apologize, but they're all of historic significance and they're of historical fact because we, I think this is something that all of us as software developers need to know. And strangely, it's something that I found a lot of us don't know. I didn't. Does anybody know what this is? If you do, it's gonna be amazing because I had never seen one before. Exactly right. This is a Denomag D11. It's a tabulating machine. You can think of it as a basically an electromechanical computer. This is a predecessor to the ENIAC style computers and electri fully electrical computers. But computation in and of itself, we often forget, started off as a mechanical process. Everything from the abacus to um, the Ada looms that were actually driven by punch cards. Right? Computation was not always an easy electronic thing and it didn't always require downloading 600 gigabytes of Node.js libs. This is a punch card that actually tabulates and would be run through the Denomag D11. Um, it's called a Hollerith punch card. It was named after a gentleman, I think in the late 1800s, who designed the punch cards um, and made a way to actually encode information onto it. So you can think of this as a very early form of data storage. Think of it like a record. And strangely enough, as Elixir people, we should be happy about this, right? Because a punch card's pretty damn immutable. This is a census form. So when Hitler came to power in 1933, I believe, one of the first things that he ordered was a census of everything and almost everyone in Germany. And specifically, the census was actually ostensibly to otherwise improve the nature of the Reich. But one thing we know about Germans is that they keep meticulous records, right? And w they found out later on that there was never any intention of uh, figuring out who was living in the Reich. It was actually figuring out who didn't need to be living in the Reich. These forms were then later tabulated onto those cards, and this is where the people who were encoded onto those cards ended up. This is Auschwitz. This is a group of people walking towards a death chamber, and that's the female and children death chamber. They were separated by sex. So the people who were here, encoded onto that, ended up here. And this is the company that actually built the hardware and the software that did it. Deomag was a wholly owned subsidiary of IBM. And there is ample evidence that shows that IBM was directing Deomag throughout the entire, both before, during, and after the war, to ensure that all the profits from IBM Germany, known as Deomag, flew, basically were illegally imported into bank accounts in Geneva and then given back over to the control of IBM. So the profits for this process went to Thomas Watson at IBM. What do you think about your ThinkPad now? <laughs> Told you, Bruce, I'd get around it a little bit. It's not cursing. <laughs> so, 
a wholly owned subsidiary and I'm using IBM interchangeably with Dino Mag, even though there were multiple legal structures that isolated and otherwise shelled off and walled off Dino Mag from IBM, the money still ended up in IBM's coffers. Um, participated actively in one of the worst atrocities in modern memory. Dino Mag was a wholly owned subsidiary. It basically ended up purchasing the first batches of equipment from IBM. When the war looked like it was pending, IBM did its best to increase its production to get more machines into the country before it was no longer allowed to import them. The census was actually the largest undertaking at the time. Before that, it was the Prussian census. You have to understand, in the age before computers, the idea of counting millions and millions of things or millions and millions of people was an astronomical task, something akin to putting a man on the moon. So they partnered with IBM to create both special punch cards and special machines that could actually process the vast amounts of biographical information they would need to identify Jews in Europe. Special cards, special widths, they designed it all. The cards themselves were incredibly complex. They were electromechanical things. The cards and the pulps actually had to be of such purity that they would not conduct electricity because they would car cause the machines to jam. And at the time, the only machines for making those cards were actually in the United States. They then, of course, once war was pending, ensured that they could manufacture those machines inside of Germany and other parts of Europe for anybody who was still allowed to trade with Germany because Americans weren't. The, there, of course, once again, there are multiple documents that show IBM took a vast quantity of punch cards and shipped them to Germany right before the embargo about trading with Germany was put in place. So the tabulators themselves, you could not buy. Does anybody remember AS400s, DB2, all that stuff? Okay. Hey, it's cool to be old. We call it seasoned. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so does anybody remember you couldn't buy an AS400? You couldn't buy a 370 or 360? You had to lease it from IBM? Yeah, well, the same thing was true of Dino Mag. You couldn't actually buy a tabulator. You could only lease it. So, yeah, they didn't buy the machines. They just paid a lease for the machines from Dino Mag slash IBM. Oh, and by the way, the punch cards could only be made on their machines. It's not like you had another source for them. They had a monopoly on both the hardware and the software. And this is just one of the machines see. So one of the machines that's there, they included tabulators, uh, punch card readers, punch card operators, all the things that were actually necessary to encode the information. The majority of those machines were leased, not bought. So on an ongoing business relationship to support this. So just some stats. Uh, at one of the Bucharest facilities in Hungary, they printed 20 million cards a year. 1.7 million cards per year were actually used to ensure the on-time operation of the train system in Hungary. You know that joke about the Germans keeping the trains running on time? A lot less funny when you can see that a human life was encoded into a card just like this. It was vastly profitable. By having a virtual monopoly on all the hardware and software, like some other companies we might have known, even our own age. Anybody remember Microsoft? By having that monopoly, they ensured that all the profits could only flow through companies that were controlled by IBM or its subsidiaries. And like I said, I'm not a big fan of slides with a lot of text, but this one I actually would like you to read because it sort of sums up everything. IBM's business was never about Nazism. It was never about anti-Semitism. It was always about the money. Before even one Jew was encased in a hard-coded Hall Earth identity, it was only the money that mattered. So you don't actually have to believe me or the facts, although I have hundreds of links and lots of stuff, because there's already a book that covers about IBM not actually making the Holocaust, just making the Holocaust more efficient, which I think is a tagline they'd really enjoy. You know, They're all about enablement. This book is probably the seminal work on IBM's involvement in the Holocaust, and it's one of the most meticulously researched books I've ever seen. Um, it has survived multiple attacks from multiple sources, 
Uh, it's a scholarly book. It is not an easy or light read, but it is the sort of book that I think we as software developers should be looking at and remembering because as Goethe said, he who cannot remember 3,000 years of human history is living hand to mouth. And if we as software individuals don't understand what we have done and what we have wrought on the world, we'll do it again. So uh, in 2001 and 2004, victims of Nazi persecution filed two class action lawsuits against IBM. 2006, a Swiss court deemed that the statute of limitations to have expired and dismissed the 2004 case. And the 2001 case disappeared when the plaintiff's lawyers withdrew in the same year. So the reason this matters is that IBM has never admitted any culpability for its participation in the Holocaust. There's never been any legal judgment about their participation. So as far as they're concerned, I suspect there's some attorney right now at IBM, if they ever see this, that they'll sit there and say, ah, that was Dale Mag, it wasn't us. I'll just point them towards this book. So, I know what you're thinking, right? Can't get any worse, Randall. This is the bottom. We just went full Nazi. And I'm sure IBM learned its lesson and has never done anything like this since. So, apartheid anyone? Okay, let me explain. I was gonna actually explain apartheid, but it's really easy. I need all the blacks on the left side of the room I need any Indian or semi-brown people in the middle. I need the whites over there. So IBM actually apparently leased some hardware to the regime that ran the apartheid government in South Africa and kept the database in something called the pass card system, which if you were in a white area or a black area, identified who you were and whether or not you were allowed to be there. So that was apparently running on some IBM hardware. So I guess they did learn their lesson. Makes great business sense. So now what? Are we all thoroughly depressed? I don't hear any giggles anymore. Did we run out of coffee? I know what you're thinking. You're gonna get sick of hearing me say that. Tell me it's okay. Tell me that there's, there's some hope here, right? This sucks. I knew somebody would get it. Follow the instructions, kids. It's okay to laugh, right? Uyghur, please. Who here knows about the ethnic Uyghurs in China and has actually heard about their oppression? All right, thanks. This is great because um, a lot of people don't know about it. So right now, the estimates are anywhere between 120,000 to 1 million Uyghurs, ethnic Uyghurs, are currently in re-education camps somewhere in China. Now, to understand what's going on there, the Chinese government has actually instituted an entire surveillance state where they have gone as far as to install cameras in the private homes, 1984 style, and they use facial recognition throughout all the spaces and public meeting places to ensure that there are no large gatherings and that individuals of interest can otherwise be identified at the state and where they were at all times. So, oops, tap too quite fast. Anybody wanna break into ice, ice, baby? So, I don't know where you've come down on this, but as it turns out, federal agencies such as VICE have actually been trolling, you know those Real ID Act databases, the one that require you to have a Real ID? Well, it turns out that any individual who's a federal law enforcement officer can go to Maryland's DMV database and run facial recognition searches on it without a warrant. And they've been using it to actually pick up immigrants. In fact, there is a currently a sort of a big kerfuffle with the state of New York about this because the state of New York actually issues and allows uh, possibly people who are seeking asylum or who are immigrants to actually get driver's licenses because you can't actually walk around the United States without an ID. And uh, they prevent searches, warrantless searches of that data set. 
ICE is basically, there are no actual statistics about how often federal officers are doing these types of dragnet searches through publicly available data sets. Uh, the state of Maryland says that ICE officials had logged into the system 14 times in 2018 and 42 times in 2019. However, it's unclear how many searches were conducted after each login or how many people were using it. Uh, and it's also unclear if they're even legally allowed to tell us how many searches were done. So if you think that what's happening to Uyghurs in China can't happen in the good old United States of America, I've got a poem for you. We live here, but if we're not very careful about what we're doing, we might be living here, right? So if you think about this, the question I have for everybody in this room is, is this a picture of you? Is this the selfie that you would take if you actually had to put something as an icon? Are you just a, a cog? I, I just work on recognition. I don't actually, I, I don't set policy. I'm just a developer. I just work here, right? My goal is to try and get you to think of yourself as a software developer as being part of something bigger than just writing a small component of a system. It's no longer okay for us to say, hey, I just write the little piece of software that's going on here, right? Like it or not, we're active participants in the things that are in the wider world. And as much fun as it is, and as much fun as we like these intellectual exercises, unfortunately, what I want you to take away from this is that the software we write goes out into the world. It has an impact and an ownership beyond anything that we actually could have thought of. And oftentimes, it interacts with things in sometimes misunderstood or devastating ways. I seriously doubt the guys who actually wrote recognition were trying to do anything other than solve this really cool, massive data set. <laughs> guys, uh, apparently I think ICE is coming for me. I, I, I gotta go. <laughs> no. The NSA is usually a lot better about these things. <laughs> so, aside from what Siri actually wants to think about things, don't think of yourself as just a cog. Just one thing I would actually ask you to do is from this point forward, think of about what you're doing and actually have some intention with that. Think about whether or not what you're doing is actually not just good for you, good for your job, good for your pocketbook, but will it be good for your children? Or will it be good for mine? So I want to leave you with this one thought, and it's not a lot of hope because I'm actually a depressing, smurfing individual. But I think there's one thing that actually makes a software developer good, and that's the desire to do better. We try and do better. We try and find better tools. We try and find better methods. We come to conferences to learn a better way. And so what I would like you to think about is that that can extend to more than just the next test that you write or the next module that you actually sit there and build. We can do better in the world at large. And like it or not, software may be eating the world, but the one thing everybody forgot is that everybody poops, right? And so we actually have an obligation to those who come behind us to leave things in a better situation than they, we found it. So. If you want any of the links or any of the data about the, what I've collected, I have like literally thousands of, or about 250 different links and articles. I'm happy to send them to you as a PDF. They're far too numerous here. And in the footnotes and the slides, they're actually pretty much the data for all these sources. I actually have the links of where you can go back and find the original source material. Um, you know what, thank you. Uh, I really actually wanted to thank Bruce for giving me the chance to, to give a talk, which is normally not on statistics. Uh, it's not on how to write a piece of software, but I think it's something that we should start thinking about. And I know it's early, so I wanted to thank you all for your attention.